Quick, tell me what the difference is between this painting and this painting. Well, one is clearly better, you might say, but they're made by the same artist during the same time period. So what's going on here? Well, the real difference here is composition. Many people think that composition is like a soup, that you throw in a few ingredients and then bam, you have your soup. But there's more to it than that. Composition is not only the carrots and the peas, but it's also the method that the chef uses. This is to say, composition is not just lines, shapes, colors, and ratios, but it's a basic way to manipulate them throughout your process to create a finished work of art. But there's our first problem. What process should you take? With so many different styles from impressionism to realism, even anime or manga, composition is often touted with rules and regulations, but with art's variability, what rule remains above all else? The rule of thirds, the golden ratio, your color theory? Well, the answer is actually quite simple, and it's illustrated by one of the most famous stories of all time. It's one major process that underlies the fundamental way human beings communicate. And in its simplicity lies the key to your compositions and the end of your frustrations. I call it the burning bush method. It's named after the famous story of Moses coming upon a bush in Egypt that was set on fire but was not consumed. It was quite an odd sight and an odd thing to mention. But we find out that it was pivotal to the foundation of world history as we know it, even in any sense of the truth. Importantly, it tells us three things about human nature. First, some things make us take notice above other things. Second, if we pay attention to things we notice, we will often find a miracle. And thirdly, only after we look do we find this miracle. More straightforwardly, in art, there is what you say, how you say it, and the meaning behind it. In other words, the bush, the fire, and the miracle. And with these three points, composition can be taught. So let's start with the what, and this is the bush. The biggest question many artists end up asking themselves is, what should I paint? Why should it be a bush? Why not a person, a rabbit, or a rock? Well, some things are inherently more interesting than others. Stories aren't just pressed between pages, we live them. Just like Moses, we live our normal lives, and certain things make us take attention. A certain person on the street, a picture of a food item on the menu, a phrase that your friend said, or a certain memory from childhood. These are all flaming bushes. Some things stick out more than others. Even in a commissioned portrait, the artist will ask the sitter to move around a few times, countless times even, in countless, scenes, in countless scenes before something clicks. They might think they know what they are doing, but the best art emerges from a happenstance and a good eye to recognize it. Certain hand positions, clothing, or lighting will strike you different ways. Finding out what to paint is the point in the process where you just throw paint on the wall until it sticks. Examples of different things that fit under this category are, are people, animals, objects, trees, etc. Consider the following quote from a famous artist. I never paint anything that doesn't excite me or make me feel a little uneasy. Wayne Thubod. Next is the how, which is the fire. So imagine if you walked into Egypt and the entire desert was set ablaze. Would one particular bush capture your attention? Probably not. That is because of difference. That is to say, if the whole desert is on fire, then why would one particular bush capture your attention? Now, I'm going to show you an artist's work of no difference versus difference. Caravaggio was known for his dark darks and his light lights, and this made the subject, or the what, much more obvious. But the what would have no punch if he was not able to say the how so clearly. You can see that in these ones where I get rid of the difference, where I lower the contrast and the saturation, there's something that is missing fundamentally from the painting. Now, look at the paintings in their original state. You can see how much of a difference how you say something has on your end product. This shows the design of the scene that is centered around bringing out the importance of one thing and subduing the rest. This falls under the category of how to say something, and it is significant. This includes the usual technical understanding of how to change an image to bring about the subject. So let's pull back up the paintings from before. We see a variety of edges where sharp edges are on the face and softer elsewhere. We see a variety of values where the darkest sit among the lightest on the face. We see big shapes in the peripheral and smaller shapes in the face. What makes this work is the same reason this watercolor doesn't work. 
That is because there is no point in the watercolor, and there is no difference to make the point clear. In other words, not only is there no bush, but there's no fire on the bush, or non-fire not on the bush. Take these random photos for example. Some things just stick out more than others. The problem is most people ignore this. This is to say there is a subject and a way to bring out its articulation. Our principles and fundamentals are like this and are key for how to say things in art. When you look at random photos, some things capture our attention more than others. And it's usually because of these art of fundamentals that this happens. That's because some of these art fundamentals are inherently more interesting than others, which are more boring. Some artists choose to set the whole desert on fire, but this is not the most optimal way of executing art. Our subject should have the most interesting elements, and the peripheral elements should be boring. This is to say, saturation captures our attention more than muddy colors, details captures our attention more than lack of details, hard edges more than soft, bright more than dark, and so on. This suggests that both are of equal importance because without an entire desert that is not on fire, why else would you look at the bush that is? We have a, we have a unique role as artists. Our composition is our playground. We decide if it's a forest or an ocean or a desert as our setting. We can make our own reality, choose our own characters, but we are beholden to one law, which dictates how we use this artistic freedom. If our work does not make one point, and if the point is not clear through how we say it, then we have nothing at all but a desolate tundra. Good reference already has these dynamics working for it and from there we can simply accentuate them. When you're starting out, you want to pick out photos where there's an obvious subject that you're emotionally captured by. Usually, later down the road, you'll be able to see why you were captured by it. But once you get good at taking references, countless years later, you'll be able to accentuate the things that actually make the reference good. This includes skills like learning gesture, rhythm, structure, or any other manipulation of the image. Consider the following quote. I paint what I see in my mind's eye, not what I see with my physical eyes. I don't paint things, I only paint the difference between things. The aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inner significance. Next, and lastly for us, is the miracle. This is actually the most elusive part of art, but it's also the most critical. It's a last push that means the difference between a true artist and a pure technician. So, a while back, I wrote that the difference between a technician and an artist is the known and the unknown. And this illustrates the chimera that is great artistic miracle. Certain art just has an otherworldly quality. Something strange, eerie, frightening, or even invigorating. Whatever it is, it gives the work a soul. It makes what it is saying significant because it is something that has never been uttered before. This is why a work by even a master can be done so well and be interesting, but not absolutely captivating. Examples of this are things that tap into our deep subconscious images that immediately become iconic once they're put into paint. Art that has to be seen and cannot be explained. I'll give you real examples of this in our next section where we see all of these three categories where they are done correctly and incorrectly in actual artwork examples. So without further ado, let's look at what happens when we violate the burning bush law. The most common category is if we have something important to say, but don't know how to say it in a capturing way, then like Moses, our viewer will just continue to walk on as if it's just another bush. This is much like modern conceptual art, where the idea might be good, as in the miracle, and the what might be clear, as in whatever they're trying to say specifically. But the problem is that they don't have the skill to give their ideas the merit they might deserve. The second most common ca category is the vice versa of this. This is where if we have no miracle to share, but our theatrics are good, then we are simply kitsch. And people will ignore our art in the same way once they stare and see no miracle within the bush. Look at Thomas Kincaid's work. He's one of the most hated artists of all time. There's usually sort of a subject, but it's not very clear. So the what's a bit shaky. There's certainly no miracle, but he blazes the how a lot. So he shows the principle of having a fire, but the bush is completely burned instead of not consumed. This is very common. 
this is where artists think that if we set the whole thing ablaze by oversaturating every color, blowing out every value, and sharpening all of our edges, then we have yelled and screamed at our viewers in a fit, and that this is what makes good art, because we gather their attention. But in reality, instead of seducing them with music, poetry, and prose, we have irritated, taken the piss out of them, or at worst, scared them off. It is not a performance when you don't use good difference. Rather, it's more like cheap theater. The third most common category is something that has a point, but a boring point that has no miracle behind it. In this example, you can see that it's certainly interesting and even attractive, but it does not grip people at the core and accomplish what exceptional art can. Fourthly, look at the balance between the elements of difference and the subject. In this case, we have the bush, the subject, the fire, the artistic technique used to draw attention, and the miracle that the bush is not consumed, which is the message that is worth sharing. The method of the burning bush serves as a law because all of our work, even imaginative work, shown here by Frank Frazetta, should be inspired by life, by authentic experiences, by the things that capture us. In fact, imagination is just the reordering of our life experiences. This gives us a starting point and validates the idea that is inherently worth sharing, a bush that will not go up in flames. And finally, we must use our artistic techniques to drive the point forward, and this is our fire. When you look at all of these examples, you will notice that there's always one major point. And you'll notice in your work or others' works that if the point is obscured, people quickly lose interest. All of this is to say, every essay has a thesis, every song a chorus, each speech a point, every book a title, and every painting a subject. Humans like to receive communication in a certain way. So next time you notice a burning bush, you may want to check it out. There might be a miracle waiting for you to uncover it.